Welcome. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Today's program is a collaboration between Matter and P33, which for those of you who aren't familiar, is a privately funded not-for-profit organization that is tasked with elevating Chicago into a tier one tech ecosystem. It's co-chaired by Penny Pritzker, Chris Gladwin, and Kelly Welsh of the Civic Committee. And one of P33's main areas of focus is deep tech. Today's program is also being supported by the Healthcare Council of Chicago, by M Hub, and by 1871. So one of the maddening things about COVID-19 is just how little we seem to know about it, which isn't entirely surprising since it didn't exist a year ago, but it's frustrating to anyone who is trying to make sense of it on a personal level, on behalf of their organization, or from a societal perspective. Our lack of complete understanding is also playing out for the first time ever in real time for all of us to see. Never before has the scientific and clinical understanding of a virus with this level of significance really developed before our very eyes on social media, on 24-hour cable news, in conversations with friends and colleagues as we all try to understand exactly what it is, how it's transmitted, how we can avoid it, and what might happen to us if we contract it. So today, we're going to review the latest of what we know about how the virus is transmitted. Uh, the team at P33 has reviewed the papers and the evidence that's out there. They've consulted with epidemiologists and compiled the data into what I think you'll find is a very easy to digest presentation. Uh, the lead on this project is Michelle Hoffman, who is the Health and Life Sciences Lead at P33. Michelle has extensive experience in the life sciences sector, including stints at Deloitte and Leering Swan, uh, and eight years uh, with Back Bay Life Sciences Advisors uh, before she joined P33. She has a PhD in molecular neuroscience from Berkeley, did a postdoc at Brandeis, uh, and has an undergraduate degree in biology from Cornell. Uh, Michelle is going to share the results of her research and analysis, and then I will moderate a discussion with her. If you have questions along the way at any time, please use the chat function, and I will try to work those into our conversation. Uh, one final note before we get started. Michelle will not be providing medical advice or guidance, uh, so please don't interpret this presentation uh, as such. And with that, I will turn it over to Michelle. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I appreciate that. So just, just to give the people on the call a little background, um, my job at P33 is really, as Stephen said, to help elevate Chicago into a tier one tech ecosystem. And I am happy to talk to any and all of you about what that means um, in my <laughs> regular life, uh, regular job. When COVID hit, uh, like every other uh, civic-minded organization in the area, and indeed uh, companies and schools, et cetera, we really tried hard to figure out how we could help. Um, we ended up helping in a couple of ways. Uh, one of them is helping to set up a uh, COVID data commons. Again, happy to talk more about that to any and each of you at your leisure. Um, and then we also helped the state a little bit um, with, with some of their needs. And in the midst of these projects that were all kind of emergency needs, um, we had to follow what people knew about COVID. So this is not, you know, this presentation um, is really a compilation of all of the work uh, that we had to do as we were trying to make ourselves more useful. And uh, Stephen had the fantastic idea of making this available as a resource for the community. How do we really say, we've looked at a lot of data and we say, you know, what does that really tell us about our different risks? So as he said, this is a look at what the data published to date tells us about the risk of COVID. Most of this is from uh, uh, up until and through August 2020. Um, I think I've updated with a couple of things that came out just recently. Um, I want to say that this changes so fast, right? So always look at the date and uh, always think about what we're going to be learning in the next few weeks, if not months. 
um, this is a resource for you, right? Um, hopefully you can make informed choices about the activities that you choose uh, to do. Um, and also, you know, go back and say, okay, what does the data tell us? Uh, as Stephen said, this is not medical advice. These in no way are guidelines for what you should do in your life or in opening businesses and offices, et cetera. And as I said before, this changes so fast that it certainly isn't the last word. So um, with all of those appropriate disclaimers, maybe we could shoot to the next slide. So really what this is, uh, or what I'm going to do today is tell you what the science tells us. How COVID is spreading, who is affected by COVID, when treatments and vaccines will be ready, uh, and keep in mind, this is just a guesstimate, and what can prevent spread and infection? What are the simple ways that infection and spread can be prevented? Can you go to the next slide? So what we've done is look through more than 30 of the, the most cited scientific papers from respected peer-reviewed journals. Um, I'm sure we'll talk at the end about <laughs> does COVID signal the end of peer review? Um, or at least uh, a, a little bit of its acceleration. Um, we've looked at what's in the news media and we've certainly um, reviewed what the CDC says. If you could go to the next slide. So let's just talk about how COVID spreads, right? You, know, you get a lot of different guidelines on what to do and how to keep yourself safe. And I know there are people that are wiping down their groceries. Um, so let's just take a look at what we know about how the virus spreads. That's the next slide. So uh, there has been a lot of controversy or at least a lot of discussion about this, but for all intents and purposes, COVID is spread by droplets that come out when people talk, cough, or sneeze. Um, and so we know also that droplets from breathing have infectious virus. Um, we know to some degree that if there are droplets on um, surfaces, there might be some risk. And we know that you can get virus, you can find virus uh, in wastewater and fecal contamination. Um, but there are some uh, hypotheses that these are less infectious particles. And I think this is an important place to pause and just say, when you see your next article on COVID and they say that the virus does X or Y or Z or virus is found here, it's really important to note that you can find remnants of a virus in many different places, even from people who are infected, but those remnants are even, uh, may not actually be infectious. And infectious means that you can take those remnants and then you can culture them again and reinfect another organism. And so when you look at the slide here, what we know is the highest risk, the most infectiousness is happening from these droplets that happen when you talk, cough, and sneeze. You can go to the next slide. And so again, areas of controversy, right? You'll hear this as asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic and, and symptomatic. I think what's important to understand is, is that the height of infectiousness happens um, right before or right around the time that people start to exhibit symptoms. There's a lot of questions on whether or not these so-called asymptomatic people can spread virus. And the issue here is, is that there isn't a great definition of asymptomatic. This virus is so insidious and has, takes uh, effect in so many different ways that um, there are reports of people coming in after a car accident, they feel fine other than the car accident, they get a CT scan and, and uh, suddenly they uh, are, what's noted is that they have the ground glass opacities that are characteristic of um, uh, COVID-19 infection. And so are people truly asymptomatic or is it that we don't know how to detect the symptoms? That being said, I think it's just, a, uh, it, it is safe to say that definitely people who will, uh, who eventually come down with symptoms are usually the most infectious right before. And then with the asymptomatic, there is some risk, um, be, primarily because we don't quite understand when somebody is truly asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic, or they have very, very light undetectable symptoms. I, I wanna note that this is the thing that makes COVID-19 
just a much bigger problem than its earlier cousin, uh, SARS. Um, in SARS, uh, is an extremely deadly virus. I think it's, it's I can't remember, 10 times more deadly than COVID-19. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. But transmission occurred after people had symptoms. So this is a big problem in that, you know, people would get uh, admitted and then they would end up infecting, you know, that whole part of the hospital. Um, at the same time, you knew that they were infectious and you could quarantine them. But the problem is by the time somebody comes down with COVID-19 symptoms, they've usually, in, or they've been infectious towards people. You can go to the next slide. So we hear a lot about these super spreader events and it makes it sound like there are specifically people out there that are like, you know, X-Men and then they can go out and super spread. Um, I think what's important to understand is, is that this is actually environmental. Um, there are certain people who right before they come down with the infection are in the right environmental circumstances from a social perspective to cause what are called these super spreader events. And indeed this follows, a, they call it the Pareto rule, which is um, you know, 80% of the cases are actually given by 20% of the people. And so over here for little hometown pride, we have um, a specific, there was a specific Chicago super spreader, um, you know, who in the course of a, of a weekend, uh, he infected, I think it was 13 people over a long weekend. And, and again, the things that he had engaged in were incredibly social, right, from a funeral to a picnic um, and sharing dinner. If you can go to the next slide. Um, but as I said before, this is likely the behavior and it's not biology. It's not that some people are, um, you know, designated super spreaders. Again, they, you know, might be in these social uh, situations, um, which involve face-to-face -face interaction, a lot of talking, a lot of hugging, um, a lot of shouting. And this is where you get these events, right? My, my favorite or another one that I think is really, really interesting is the choir practice where one people, one person came in, they were socially distanced, but there is this thought because it was choir practice and they were all singing um, that uh, that was how there was a super spreader event there. You can go to the next slide. So, so this is one of the reasons why you hear all this advice to stay away from crowded places stay away from closed environments, so poor ventilation, and obviously close contacts. All of these, right, is based on the knowledge that we have to date, and there's still a lot of gaps in the research, right? So what is the right crowd size? Um, so definitely 100, a crowd of 100 can contain one to seven people, and again, this is looking at statistics of, of um, infections that occur later. I have seen reports that say that anything over 20 is where you start to have risk. Um, and so you need to use this information at your discretion, but essentially anywhere that there are crowds, it's a really, really good spot for super spreading. Certainly 100, the threshold is typically 20. Um, closed spaces. Now, this is tied to ventilation. Again, there's still some uh, a lot of work to be done to really understand exactly how the ventilation affects spreading. Um, we do know that, you know, again, this is looking post hoc at different um, infection events. So like in a restaurant or in an airplane following the airflow. And what they can say is, is that they know that in some cases the airflow did contribute um, to infection. And so if there isn't good ventilation, that could be a problem. I've heard things like just cracking a window could make a huge difference. <clears throat> Close contacts, again, um, you know, there's this idea that like uh, uh, if you are in the same house with somebody, uh, you are definitely going to get COVID. That's, that is not entirely the case. It's uh, extremely variable. And a lot of that depends on the age of the people and like how many precautions they've, they've taken. But I think the upper threshold is 50%. Um, and I think really somewhere between three and 20% is what's being cited in most um, uh, 
of the journal articles that we've seen. And so, and that's three to 20% of people in the same household. So close contact certainly has an effect, but just being in the same household as somebody um, doesn't necessarily mean that you will get COVID. It's really a combination of all of these things. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we say these, you know, stay away from crowds, stay away from um, poor ventilation, stay away from close contacts. And I think uh, there was a paper just recently published, and I took this figure out of it uh, from the British Medical Journal. I, I think this was a few weeks ago. They kind of gave us a heuristic about risk, right? Because it's never um, binary. And so what they did is it's defined to think about where your setting is and what your behaviors are. And you can see here that, you know, if you are in a, a crowded spot and you are shouting and not wearing a mask, that is your highest risk. And your lowest risk, of course, is wearing a mask and being somewhere um, with low occupancy. And again, this is just a good, you know, it's, it's not a formula, but it's a good rule of thumb for the levels of risk that you're undertaking. You go to the next slide. So if there is an exposure, what does that mean, right? So again, I think it's always important to go back to um, you, a, a patient or a person is probably most infectious right before or right around the time they start to exhibit symptoms. And it's usually about five days after exposure, but that can go, it can happen as long, as short as two days and for as long as 14 days. Um, and I think uh, that's really important to note because there certainly are all of these checks such as temperature checks that they're using in airports and they use in schools and et cetera. And I think it's good to weed out people who are certainly sick and have them go home. But in a lot of cases, though, they will not catch the COVID patients that are or people that are most likely to spread. Um, and then in terms of uh, symptoms, um, the general course, if you do get COVID, is about two weeks, but we certainly hear about long haulers who are having symptoms uh, for weeks or months. And then in terms of detecting virus, um, uh, the, um, the virus can be detected up until like months, months after infection. Uh, and there's still some debate of whether when you detect that virus from uh, people, whether it's in fact infectious. Um, in terms of the risk of spreading, so this is really, really a difficult, uh, it's, it's a difficult number to point, to pin down. And so some of the work that um, we use to go into what is the risk of spreading is really looking at, you know, a statistical survey of looking at pairs of what they call the primary and the secondary um, so the first person was infected and the second person was infected. And um, what is the time in between when the first person was infected, right? And started to show symptoms and the second person started to show symptoms. And based on that, right, um, we can, uh, they've modeled that the risk of infectiousness peaks at about five to six days for the first person. So again, going back to that point of right before symptoms. So if somebody is infected by COVID-19, what's going to happen to them? Who's affected? And so that's what we'll talk about in this next section. So you've heard this before, right? And again, this is because, so, so it turns out that any, any claim you make about COVID is probably true, right? It's just like the flu, it's not like the flu, et cetera, because it is so, um, what we would say in biology, pleiotropic, right? It, it manifests very differently depending on different people. And there's a huge variability um, in terms of how people are affected by it and who's affected by it. So statistically speaking, more than 80% of cases are mild, right? And we define mild as not needing hospitalization. Um, you can talk to people who have mild cases and are not hospitalized in extremely unpleasant. Um, in terms of how they're feeling, how they can function, and of course, the long-term supply, right? Um, but when we think about flattening the curve and the issue that we have for our healthcare system, the hospitalizations are very, very important, right? 
And so it's really important to understand that there's only a certain percentage of patients that need hospitalization that will be sucking up those very um, uh, uh, precious resources of both our healthcare providers and space. So overall, your, uh, your likelihood of being se severely affected is low, but as always, there are caveats. And so if you could go to the next slide. Uh, you happen to uh, not be a person of color and you happen to be a woman. So these are the um, risk factors or these are, uh, I, I don't want to call uh, gender your comorbidity, but these are the comorbidities or the demographics that um, seem to indicate that, that you one is more statistically likely to have a severe case. Um, so uh, uh, if you are not white, um, which is to some degree 40% of the patient of the population. Uh, if you are male, uh, and we'll go into what the risk factors are there. Males are have a much harder go of it uh, than females. Um, uh, if you are older than 65, and if you have a pre-existing chronic condition, right? So if you do these cuts. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we haven't done, uh, you know, all the combinatorial math combinations, but a very significant percentage of the U.S. is actually at risk for a severe case of COVID. And so if you go to the next slide, we can actually look at what does this mean in terms of the actual numbers, right? So, again, it's really important with COVID because you know, what is it that people say? Uh, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Um, you can always come up with a number that sort of satisfies your, your general um, thesis, but it's important to not just look at the statistics, but also look at the, average, at the absolute numbers, right? So certainly, right, the COVID-19 hospitalizations are more dense the older you are, but there is not an insignificant number for under 49. And I think this is important because as we're seeing cases rise um, across the US, what you're seeing more and more of is these um, younger people getting infected. Um, they may not be hospitalized at the same rate, but the rate of hospitalization for that age group um, can be higher or is getting higher um, uh, as, as you're getting more um, vulnerable people. And then in addition, those younger people are definitely vectors for secondary and tertiary exposure. And so again, you see commensurately, the death rate um, uh, is much higher in the over 65 than in the younger population. You can go to the next slide. And so I think one of the most striking, and uh, I'm trying to find the right word, um, the one of the most heartbreaking uh, parts of this disease, and this is something, you know, again, we ran into time and time again as we thought about how to build the COVID data commons, about, you know, what the state and the city needed to do. Um, and just, you know, as a citizen of uh, Chicago and the US, is the fact that this is disproportionately affecting Black and Latinx people on a scale that is just again, it's staggering and heartbreaking, right? So they are dying at three to five times the rate of white patients, um, even though their share of the population is much lower, right? And I think if you look even at the young patient deaths, right? Again, this is why it's really, really important to start digging into the numbers. Although young people certainly have a survival advantage, right? If we look at the actual uh, uh, COVID-19 deaths at this point, it's, it's non-white young people are making up a huge proportion of those, those deaths. And, and it, is, it is, you know, there are so many reasons for this and that's a whole other um, uh, webinar. Um, but I think that this should be first in everybody's mind when they think about what can we do about this pandemic, because these are the people that typically have the least um, access 
to good healthcare from a historic perspective and certainly um, during this crisis. You can look at the, you can turn to the next slide. And I think it's very clear that this is true in Chicago, right? Um, I think Chicago has done a really fantastic job of even collecting those data and that information. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this is in every person who is weighing in on this effort's mind whenever they come up with solutions. So um, I think that, you know, I'd like to just say I'm extremely proud to be a citizen of Chicago. Every meeting that I've been in, people have been extremely conscious of this. But I, I think as citizens, we also have to note that this is affecting um, you know, our neighbors of color uh, in significant and stark ways. Let me go to the next slide. So now with the reopening of school, we've talked a little bit about um, your ethnicity, uh, we've talked about age, um, and we've talked about the older population, but then there is, again, a lot of controversy about children. Um, and so you'll hear all kinds of things about children. Um, and, you know, it is safe, it's not safe, etc. I think uh, the best way I could sum up what we know so far is that um, children are certainly less susceptible to severe infection, right? So if a child gets infected, they're much more likely to have a less um, severe course. Um, you know, depending on the research that you look at, right? Um, uh, and a lot of this is coming from Korea. I think there's um, some work from Israel um, where they're really trying to make sure they capture all of the infected cases. Um, even if they're asymptomatic or very lightly symptomatic. And so the number that we've gotten is fewer than 20% will develop uh, symptoms. Um, at the same time, I think we should keep in mind that as of September 3rd, half a million children in the U.S. have been infected. And so even if they have a lower course or, or uh, less severity of infection, right, we still don't quite understand how infectious they are. And again, there's controversies depending on what study you look at as whether or not they're actually transmitting or not. Um, uh, and so I think, um, and again, I won't go into those controversies uh, in too much detail other than to say there's a question about whether or not younger children are actually as infectious as older children. And so this is over the age of 10. Um, I think the best thing to think about is the fact that you are getting schools closing, you are getting camps closing, right? And this, this is happening with the spread of virus where younger kids are involved. Um, and so something is happening there. And then we also know that if we quarantine or if we use really good um, social distancing uh, structures like they've done in some camps and schools, like there's a specific camp in Maine that did this, that they're able to reduce the spread. So whatever the degree of infectiousness that children have remains to be, you know, well, everybody to agree on, but we do know that virus can spread in these situations. And the second really concerning thing um, that I think is important about children, if you go to the next slide, is that a very small percentage of children have get this multi-system inflammatory system. Right, and so um, what we know is uh, uh, that it's extremely rare. Um, it happens in kids between the ages of five and in adolescence, um, and that's about what we know. It's a very concerning thing. It's extremely rare, um, and it seems to be some sort of pediatric correlation to the uh, um, uh, the inflammatory overload that happens when older people get really sick from COVID. So you can go to the next slide. And so as I said before, right, regardless of whether your particular child or a particular child is at risk for a severe course or will be spreading, um, you know, at the, at the degree of an older person, we, we do know 
and I think these slides were put together sort of earlier in August, uh, that um, schools could certainly become hotbeds of transmission because you do have older people in the schools, right? Um, and I think, you know, some of the models said that the school districts with 500 or more um, uh, students will have at least one infected person. And then if you consider the way that they intermingle and the fact that um, a quarter of, you know, adult teachers are considered high risk, right? This, this is where the schools are extremely concerning. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> this is nowhere more true than at the schools where they are resource poor and the facilities are not great. They don't have the space to social distance. There may be issues with ventilation. Um, and then, you know, you, you add in that you're also having kids um, from vulnerable populations going. So again, our, 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 you know, we know that this is generally true and then it's worse so for our, the more vulnerable parts of our population. You can go to the next slide. So what is happening then is that you're seeing um, widespread in institutions. And this is where we are getting like some of the most hair-raising reports from prisons as well as from long-term care facilities, right? So you're getting, um, you know, long-term care facilities because of the institutional aspect as well as the age aspect, right? Um, and then obviously uh, prisons because of the institutional um, aspects. And, and then the people that come to work here are considered essential workers. And we know from the long-term long care facilities that a lot of the spread is coming from those younger essential workers that come in and spread it around. And so what is an underlying condition, right? So um, what we looked at is what are the conditions where you probably have the most, or someone would have the most risk of um, having a severe course. And it's going to be your heart disease, um, chronic kidney disease, COPD, um, obesity, uh, sickle cell, and then people who have undergone organ transplants and, and type 2 diabetes. And these are all cardiorenal syndrome, right? Or, or sorry, cardiorenal system. Uh, effects. Um, and so these people tend to be a lot more um, susceptible to these uh, severe cases. Um, and then, but if we look at, you know, other things that could be considered a uh, pre-existing condition, right, like asthma, which I mean, certainly in mechanistic ways is related to COPD, there's still less of a risk. Um, of, of having a severe case, or the evidence is mixed, right? The same with dementia, stroke, and hypertension. And, and again, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, there's more that's written on this, but there seems to be some metabolic component to COVID infection and the risk of COVID. And that's kind of what you see between these two, you know, the strong evidence um, versus the mixed evidence. Right, and then the limited evidence. I want to be really clear. It does not mean that people with immune deficiencies are not more susceptible. It's just we don't have a lot of good data. So that does not mean that people are, you know, free and clear. I would make the assumption that anybody with a weakened immune system um, is at higher risk uh, for infection and also clearing it. It's just a matter of what the data tells us. So you can go to the next slide. So what is really interesting about this disease, and we've known this for a while, is that um, men have, you know, are, are hospitalized and dying at twofold the rate of women. Um, and this has been hypothesized um, for many reasons, uh, you know, lifestyle, um, smoking, respiratory issues, and even the ACE2 um, receptor. Uh, that is the um, receptor on the cells that um, 
uh, COVID-19 uses to infect. Um, but regardless of you know, why it is, we do know that there certainly is uh, a much higher risk uh, for men than for women. So what happens after you have COVID? And these are what are called the long haulers. Um, we don't have enough evidence yet. Uh, in fact, there are some more numbers here under cardiac, but there's, again, there's controversy there about, you know, um, uh, uh, who they were looking at and how they were looking at them. Suffice to say that, and I think I would look less at the actual numbers and just know that we find surprising or people are finding surprising long-term effects in brain, um, they, certainly lung scarring, uh, myopathy in the heart. And then just this like chronic syndrome of fatigue, right? Of people reporting symptoms that are variable months after infection. And so I think this is going to be an area of significant research um, for uh, a long time to come, even after we're hopefully, you know, in the era of new treatments and a vaccine. So when, when will these things be ready? <laughs> Okay, so the short answer is really no one knows. So what I'm going to tell you um, is, uh, you know, what, what we kind of know based on the timetable of normal times, and then you can make your uh, suppositions from there. Um, so what we know is that remdesivir and dexamethasone, which is a steroid that's been used uh, for years, it's generic, both of those have utility in uh, severely ill patients. Um, the dexamethasone, I think, came out of England and remdesivir was global. And those are two treatments that we use. Uh, they are really used for end stage. They are not, um, you know, the, the really savior treatment uh, that we're looking, <laughs> we're looking for. Um, and there are a number of other things in the pipeline. There's a lot more than these treatments. These are just some of the few that we think are representative, right? Um, and so a couple that you might have um, heard about uh, are convalescent plasma. And so there was an emergency use authorization of that, I think last week or the week before. Um, you know, again, this is something that can be used in very sick patients. Um, it's shown some utility. Uh, you know, again, there's some issues about, you know, was it placebo controlled? Do we know what this does or nothing? And the answer is we don't. Um, but again, it's another tool in our arsenal. Uh, so uh, one of the interns that worked for me this summer um, uh, was an extremely bright and promising uh, young woman, wanted to make sure that everybody knew that bleach, disinfectants, UV light, and UV light in the body um, are not good treatments. Now, I want to say, like, you know, we, we said that sort of tongue in cheek, right? I want to say that UV light is actually really interesting. It's an interesting idea from an environmental perspective, and indeed there are reports on that, about whether that's something that we could use, you know, together with ventilation to be able to inactivate virus before it like comes out into our offices and things like that. So that might be interesting, but UV light as a human treatment is certainly not right now uh, <laughs> uh, in the lexicon of treatments. You can go to the next slide. And I think the other thing that you're gonna hear about is like, oh, there's no natural immunity to COVID, that's why this disease is, is, is very um, deadly. And that is in fact true, right? So we, we don't have uh, antibodies that recognize coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, it does turn out that there might be some signals in what we call T cells. It's another part of our immune system um, that's part of the, what we call the adaptive immune system. Um, and it, it could be that some people have T cells um, that might be more easily activated uh, and, and thus have a less, um, uh, a less severe course. Um, it also may be that this prevents some people from, you know, from actually getting infected in the way that others do. It's not clear. But I think the reason why I have this 
here is that we should understand that the immune response is extremely complicated. And when people say things like, oh, you know, there's no, um, uh, you know, they don't have uh, antibodies to this or that, that's not the whole story. There are many more components of the immune system that need to be considered even, even post-infection. Right, so you may have heard of neutralizing antibodies, and these are the antibodies that people want to see. Uh, they say that you're, what they tell us, if you have quote unquote neutralizing antibodies, they're literally antibodies that neutralize the virus. In a lab, you can put them in a petri dish and they prevent the virus from going into cells. Um, and so you'll hear these reports of saying, you know, people six months after don't have neutralizing antibodies and suddenly you'll get these media reports saying that, you know, there's no immunity to, you know, there's no long-term immunity. And I'm putting this here so that in case you hear that, you know that there are more things than the neutralizing antibodies and also the absolute levels. So we're studying both, or people are studying both of those with regard to uh, COVID response. Where's the vaccine? <laughs> um, so it is entirely possible that we could have a vaccine um, by January. There's a lot of skepticism about this as well. Um, but, you know, again, nobody knows the answer. I will say that the degree to which um, the companies have undertaken both, you know, the, the manufacturing as well as the early stage trials has been breathtaking in terms of its rapidity. Um, but you still have to do a phase three trial. You still have to be tested on a certain number of people for statistical uh, significance. And we know uh, that AstraZeneca, one of the ones that was furthest along, actually had a halt, I believe it was either yesterday or the day before for safety reasons. Um, and again, we don't know what that means. We don't know how many patients that is. We don't know if that was, you know, some people are saying it's routine and some people say that's never routine. Um, but this is the way drug development happens. It just happens to be that this is happening with um, probably, you know, four to six billion people anxiously watching. Um, so, you know, rule of thumb, uh, take whatever people say and then add six months. And so, you know, I'm reasonably hopeful we will have something we can use um, by the middle of 2021. Um, and if it happens before that, I will be super ecstatic as well. So on the next slide. So what is it that we know can be done to prevent the spread as we are waiting for a vaccine or more treatments? And you can go to the next slide. In all honesty, you know, and again, they're, they're um, models are just models. That's what they are. So this looks very mathematical and quantitative. Um, uh, but what the models do tell us is, and we can see this from other countries, is that masking is probably one of the most effective things we can do. Wearing a mask is really, really important. It prevents, uh, you know, it, it, it is a barrier to those droplets that transmit the virus. I would say, you know, uh, uh, I, wearing a mask gives me a lot more comfort than wiping down my groceries or, you know, even washing my hands. I mean, obviously I wash my hands all the time, um, but what, we know is, is that in order to get infected with COVID, it's not just like you need one virus to get in you or two particles or three, you need a lot of particles. You need a bolus of particles and the degree, how fast you get infected and how bad it is may be related to that bolus. It's one of the reasons why people think that healthcare providers um, get severely, even the young ones get severely affected by COVID-19. They're around all the time and they get these massive, you know, from, from some of the procedures that they do or some of the ways that they're around patients, right? They'll get exposure to these droplets. It's why the PPE is so important and the N95 masks and we need to conserve it for them. So wear your cloth mask. Actually, I, I can't say that. I'm not giving you medical advice. Um, masks are important. You can go to the next slide. 
there is some idea that just opening a window, right? Increasing airflow. Certainly being outside is better if you are going to be in a risky encounter than being inside. Again, we have to stay at home, uh, or we are told that we should be staying at home, but we know that that's not always possible. And so if uh, um, you are, or somebody is taking transportation, right, we know that the more area you share with somebody, the um, uh, more difficult, or the more likely there is risk, right? So there's, you know, things that can be done, like going into a cab, trying not to share a cab, opening uh, the window um, on airplanes, uh, right? It's, I mean, honestly, those seats in between are really, really important. And I think there are data to, uh, to really show that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, also really understanding how ventilation within an airplane can actually affect spread. Um, it's still something that we don't quite understand or know. So you can go to the next slide. So what experts say is wear a mask, maintain six feet of distance. I do want to say about the six feet of distance, um, it is actually interesting where that comes from. <laughs> it comes from experiments, uh, some of which were done in the 40s, right? Just looking at, and I can't remember what they were using, um, uh, it could have been strep, I don't remember, um, but just measuring how, how many people got infected within six feet. And that's how they came up with the six feet of distance. Um, in all honesty, you know, as much as you can distance yourself from someone as is reasonably practical is important because of the way that droplets travel. Um, and, uh, and we know that that's where the virus is. So um, keeping as much distance as you can and wearing a mask and really just thinking about those droplets are really important. I think that's the next, the last slide. So that concludes the slides. Great. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, it was a fascinating presentation. I think you and your team uh, really did uh, an extraordinary job of compiling a lot of data that's out there and making it digestible and in a really compelling, easy to understand format. Um, to really appreciate that you did that and that um, you uh, are taking the time to share it with our uh, community. Um, I, I have like uh, a lot of questions from before and then I jotted down more during this and then there's ones from the audience. Um, but you know, given we have limited time, maybe I'll um, focus on the ones uh, that the audience asked uh, first. Um, and so I think you can see those too, but you know, the, the first uh, person who's asking a, a question is really, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into cleaning uh, surfaces and disinfecting workspaces and schools. So, you know, the, the standard protocol when, when there's an infected person in a workplace or in a school or something like that is shut the place down and do a thorough deep cleaning and, and disinfect everything and it, it sounds like from your presentation that fomite uh, transmission is not you know you kind of sort of joked a little bit about people wiping down their groceries and and you know based on what we know it's really more of an airborne situation uh, than a than a surface uh, situation so is is all of this precaution a waste of time and money and energy and and resources Without uh, getting into specific guidance, um, what I can say is I, the risk from the data that we see, the risk is much higher of transmitting from any sort of respiratory event uh, than picking it up from a surface. Um, and so I can't tell you whether it's a waste of resources. Um, I can say that um, it would be more comforting you know, certainly you should wipe things down, et cetera, but like the amount of deep cleaning that's there, I, I, I actually struggle sometimes to understand exactly why um, uh, that happens, right? Um, when there is so much transmission through respiration. 
but I'm not giving guidance. <laughs> exactly. So we'll leave it at that for the moment. Right. <laughs> um, there's a, a question about, you presented some data on uh, kind of disparities between white and non-white populations uh, for, I think, hospitalizations and, and mortality. Um, the uh, to, to what extent is that data normalized for right. pre-existing conditions, socioeconomic status, uh, right. vascular disease, things like that? So I don't have the numbers, but I know that people have done those analyses. And I believe that when they've actually corrected, you know, when they've taken that into account, there's still um, a, uh, uh, there's still a disparity. And so people look for, a people are looking for a biological basis and there's some chatter over that, but the other thing could be, um, you know, even when you correct for um, uh, pre-existing conditions, that it's really the, um, it's really uh, like the years of neglect beforehand, right? So the poor access to healthcare and then all the social determinants of health. Um, that being said, I don't know about socioeconomic status. Um, I, I seem to remember that I saw something about that, but I don't know. I certainly know that for the um, pre-existing conditions, so we can definitely look into that. Yeah, and I know I have seen some other data, it was from a health system that looked at the population in their area and did adjust for socioeconomic mm -hmm. data and a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other things, and, and still the results looked fairly similar to what you presented. Um, so, um, all right, there's, there's another one on uh, sort of, a, uh, you know, the low incidence of transmission on public transit. Mm -hmm. Is that really because it's hard to, because intuitively you're mm -hmm. on a box, in a box with a bunch of people. Is right. it, is, is the issue, is the reason why there's low transmission because there's something that's not as dangerous as it appears or just because there's nobody using it and <laughs> people are able to socially distance? That I couldn't tell you. Um, uh, I'd probably need to go back and look at those reports and say, you know, did they normalize it for ridership? Um, I think the, I think the best way, so what I do know well is the airplane transmission. And again, um, there's less people riding airplanes and to some degree there's a low transmission there, but when they, but there is a big possibility of super spreader events on an airplane. And so I think that you could probably extrapolate that to a bus or a subway as well. Um, even if there's low transmission, right, you still have that risk of being in a, in a small crowded space uh, with a number of people. But specifically for um, buses and subways, I couldn't tell you right now. I'd have to go check about whether that's been normalized for ridership. Um, so you talked about asymptomatic people, obviously, and you talked about people who develop kind of long-term chronic uh, issues associated mm -hmm. with it. Um, you know, in an extreme end, there's the, this phenomenon of long haulers who have COVID kind of residual symptoms, some of which are quite uh, debilitating and serious for months. <laughs> do, do asymptomatic people, do, what does the data say? Do, do asymptomatic people develop long-term uh, chronic responses uh, to, the, to the virus? Or if you're asymptomatic, are you in the clear? Yeah, um, so uh, this is one where I, I'd want to go back and double check and make sure that I have the right references. What I can say is, is that there's a lot of discrepancy or a lot of argument about what who is truly asymptomatic. And so if you can get an agreement on who's asymptomatic, I think then doing that long haul study, and I, I don't recall seeing one, that doesn't mean it hasn't been done. Then I think doing that long haul study, we could get some data from that that would be useful. But to date, I mean, there's still, you know, disagreements about what it means to be asymptomatic, and then even whether or not there's asymptomatic transmission, which, you know, again, is, is a whole other um, bag of worms. Um, gosh, there are so many interesting questions coming in, and we're really not going to have time for um, the rest of these. Uh, but I would say 
a couple of things to close it out. So we will go through these questions and we will post, uh, first of all, we're gonna post a recording uh, of this session on our uh, website. So a few people had asked uh, whether that would be available. So it will be available. It'll be on the matter.health um, site. We will also work with Michelle to provide answers to questions that we weren't able to answer in this time frame and put those up on our site as well. Uh, so look for that in the coming days. Um, if you have other questions that uh, occur to you in the next you know, few minutes after we close the meeting and you haven't put it in the chat, you can just send it to info at matter.health and uh, we'll work that into uh, what we're doing. So um, Michelle, thank you again uh, so much for for um, doing this and, and putting the data together. And, and it's really so timely and so fascinating uh, to watch this all unfold in, in real time. I just, I can't think of anything in my lifetime that's been anything like this in terms of watching the scientific understanding of something meaningful uh, just play out before, uh, before our eyes. Um, so uh, with that, um, you can learn more about upcoming programs that we have on our site, uh, matter.health. We've got a number of uh, really interesting uh, opportunities uh, over the course of the rest of this month and going forward. And thanks to everyone uh, for spending part of your day uh, with us. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, stay safe, everyone.